I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Got like space, man. Huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Hey, what's up, everyone? I hope you're doing well. Uh, uh, welcome to Wrestle Rock Podcast Season 5. I'm your host, Nastrada Ben, and I am with my partner, Johnny D. Yeah, how's it going, my friend, today? Fine, and you? Yes, I'm going super great. And you know what? A music episode. I... Yes. Uh, so give it up for a former uh, veteran basis for White Snake, Ozzy Osbourne, and of course, Quiet Riot. Rudy Sarzo, is he going today, my friend? I am, I am blessed. How are you guys doing? Yes, we're going super great. And finally, we got that. So uh, we know that you are very busy with a lot of things. And, and the timing is not necessarily the right. But here we go. We got, we got you uh, for uh, a couple of minutes. So here we go with the first question. So go ahead, my friend. Uh, uh, can I start with a funny question? <laughs> Go. Oh, yeah, please. I love funny questions. Okay. Uh, was the character Tony Montana from Scarface inspired you by your own experiences, considering you were born in Cuba and immigrated to Florida? <laughs> well, actually, it did not really inspire me. But uh, uh, Oliver Stone, who wrote the script for the movie, he <laughs> spent a lot of time in Miami studying the, uh, the culture and what was going on. And I was already in Los Angeles and some of it, I was already touring with Ozzy. When, when did that happen? Because I joined Ozzy in 81. So we're talking about 1980, yes. the Mario boat lift when all the Cubans uh, came over here uh, to the United States. Basically this is what happened. Castro went on TV and announced that anybody with families living in Miami could come on a boat to this port called Mariel Port, uh, po uh, port okay. and pick up your relatives. Okay. You know, because that nobody was allowed to leave, leave the island. Mm -hmm. So this is at the core. This is how Tony Montana arrives in the United States. What happened was that Castro took all of the, uh, all the people that were really draining his economy, such as the people in jail, mm -hmm. uh, the elderly, that he could not afford to uh, take care of them and you know the undesirables and he just put them took them to the port and when people when when um, the people from the united states arrive in their in their own boats to pick up their relatives they were told oh no no you gotta take these people with you back to miami we'll send your relatives on a different boat wow so there they are already and going like okay what are we gonna do i mean If we don't take these people, they're not going to send our relatives on another boat. So that's how, <laughs> that's, how that's, that's what happened, you know? <laughs> wow. So, uh, so that is depicted in the movie somehow, somewhat. I mean, they don't go into detail about how it happened, but they just go into the detail of how this individual, Tony Montana, who was actually a criminal from, from coming from Cuba, uh, among, there's a scene that is, uh, it's a fence area in an underpass of the uh, of the freeways going into downtown Miami and everybody's put there okay. you know like a like you know waiting to be vetted to see if they they're allowed into society that really happened that place is still there that and and the fence is still there the real fence uh, you know from 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 back in the day but you know these are everything that was depicted and I know a lot of Tony Montana type characters in Miami because you know there's a certain thing about Cubans uh, that re remain really close to their cultural. They haven't really adapted to to being more American. Yeah, whatever that means nowadays. Because when when I when I got to the United States in '61, 
being American meant more like being John Wayne. <laughs> and John Wayne now is canceled. <laughs> they, 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 he had an airport in Long Beach named after him, John Wayne Airport. And this is a man who was married to a Mexican lady, spent a lot of time in Mexico, but somehow they connected him with being a racist. I, I have no idea how that happened, but he, people that get dead connected with racism somehow or whatever, they get canceled really quickly. I'll give you another example. Sharon Osborne. Now I'm Cuban and I was even more Cuban 40 years ago when I first joined Ozzy. I don't know if you guys know this in Canada, but she got, she got canceled and accused of being racist. Now I know for a fact that she's not. And I, I'll give you examples. Okay, when I first joined the band, I moved in with them. They had no idea what this guy was like, except that Randy Rhodes recommended me. So he must be okay. Never, ever, ever show any racist, mm -hmm. nothing racist towards me. And I had a thicker accent, if you can even believe that, back then. I had everything. I was more Cuban then than I am now, 41 years later, 42 years later. Okay, they've had the most diverse band members of any any solo band you know ozzy as a soloist right yes. randy castillo he's you know mexican native mm -hmm. uh they have uh after me they had jakey lee in the band japanese you know yeah. uh robert trujillo mexican from mm -hmm. from uh, now he plays with metallica mike inez filipino and there might be a couple more <laughs> that just bypassed me. But uh, yeah, they never, oh, they never had any problems yeah. with diversity, cultural diversity. So I, I, I don't know how she, the, the people who canceled her got away with it. Mm -hmm. But that's bullshit. Uh, that's bullshit, of course. Yeah. And um, after that, uh, you took the decision to, uh, to, uh, to play uh, bass guitar. So... Could you please uh, share uh, when and where you you uh, you begin playing the bass guitar as well as uh, Utal too? Okay, how I became a bass player was, you know, the bass was pretty much a new instrument when I first started playing it. Yes, you know, around 1960. It's, uh, it's, I it's mean, a brand new. I, I, start, I started playing bass. Well, <laughs> I started paying attention to what a bass player does. In 1966, uh, I have just moved into a neighborhood in Miami. I have moved in from New Jersey. And uh, first we went from Favana to Miami. Then we were relocated to New Jersey. Then my parents returned back to the same neighborhood okay. in okay. Miami in 66. And I uh, back then, our social media was <laughs> having a band, being in a band. That's how we socialized back then. And uh, every block had a band, so I I uh, went down to the garage where the the band of, of my block was rehearsing at, and I brought my acoustic bass because nobody nobody could afford real instruments back then, you know. <laughs> and uh, we, I just walked in and say I introduced myself and I say I I would like to join your band. So they look at, at my guitar and they go, Oh, we got too many guitar players. It was about five or six of them in the band, you know. And they say, if you, if you want to join us, you have to play bass. And I go, what is that? And they go, <laughs> it, they say, it's like playing a, a solo during the whole song. And I said, that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's easier, it, it, it's easier to, play, uh, to play bass because uh, um, the, um, you know, how we said, the, uh, the accord, uh, accord uh, the, 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 not the accord. Uh, the, put the rope the, the, no, no, yes no, no. because the, the the rope is is different and the um the 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 the, 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 the playing is very different than uh guitar so that's uh that's what that's what i you know so i uh, go ahead for the, yeah. the second question sorry i mean okay can i defend <laughs> yeah go the ahead. position of all of us bass players that devote our lives to playing the bass yeah, it's not, it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> you know, I'm as a matter of fact, any instrument, it's not as easy as it looks. Try picking up a harmonica and playing it like Stevie Wonder. It's not as easy as it looks, does it? It's a tiny little thing. 
Mm-hmm. And you, but make it sound like Stevie Wonder does. No, it's not that easy. Uh-huh. Uh, but, uh, but you know, about the bass, you know, I mean, it's a whole different role. It's like looking at a drummer and say, oh, I can do that. I just take two sticks and beat on the, these uh, drums and I'm done. No, it's not. I'm sorry. It's, you know what? It, it, any instrument, musical instrument, is it's like a language because you have to learn how to speak that, that language. And it's an instrument of communication, just like your vocal cords are an instrument of communication. It's what you have to say that really... Uh, it's the most important thing. It's just like when we speak, what am I saying? Well, I'm, right now I'm defending all of our bass players, <laughs> brothers and sisters. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm using certain vocabulary, you know, something that we, we can all relate to. And if anybody's tuning in, they can really understand. Now, if I go into like uh, musical theory and, and, you know, stuff like that, that the average person does not understand, then we're going to lose them. So we have to stick stick to the fundamentals of it. And sometimes... Bass sounds really easy because sometimes it really, you know, in pop music, it de- deals mostly with the fundamentals of what you need to say in order to support the melody of the song and the lyrics, you yeah. know. But a true musician is deeper. It's, you usually hear on a record 2 or 3% of what a musician is actually capable of playing. Yeah. Mm-mm. Depending the riff you you play, uh, that's a, a different level of uh, of skill you need, and and depending uh, the level you want. So uh, for being a, a very good player for any instrument, you know, you need to play uh, practically every day and many hours per day, you know. And, uh, oh, you need to practice, yeah, yeah you know, exactly. many, many yeah. hours. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, from, from somebody that does this for a living, I, I can tell you, it, it's not as just much practicing as it is to absorb new information or a new point of view, perception yeah. of the, those 12 notes mm-hmm. that we have to play with. Yeah, And there, it's an infinite, infinite possibilities of it. It's just finding, because you hear the possibility, but it's... What does it mean? How, how can I apply this? Or how do I get to play that? So, mm-hmm. you, you know, you go on YouTube, there'll be somebody showing you what you're looking for. Uh, my algorithm on YouTube knows exactly what I'm looking for. So it's like, bam, 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 sends me all these possible uh, lessons that I might be taking, like I just took one today. And, mm-hmm. and sometimes I'll have the instrument on me. And, and sometimes I'll just, like today I didn't, I just watched the lesson and try to really internalize what yeah. was being told without the instrument in my hand just by reading the sheet music that was presented yeah. as the uh, the instructor is telling me what what he's doing yeah. and um so it, it's it, it's it's very it's really more complex than just by listening to to a pop song you go like oh okay you know case in point in the same week i recorded speak of the devil with ozzy you know, and I'm playing, you know, Geezer Butler mm-hmm. lines. And then the same week, I recorded Come On, Feel the Noise. If you listen to what I play in Come On, Feel the Noise and what I play in Speak of the Devil, you think it's two different guys. No, it's it's me. One week in the same week. <laughs> it's, not like I, it's not like I got much better or worse. It's the same guy. But here I am playing with Ozzy. Speak of the Devil, Black Sabbath songs. And you can, you know, it's, it's a recording of Black Sabbath songs that we did back in 1982. That was the last time I played with Ozzy. Uh, you can find that all over YouTube in case you don't know what I'm talking about. You know, whoever's listening, watching. And, uh, and come on, feel the noise. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's on the radio all the time. But it's just a simple, you know, bass line playing for what the song is all about. That's insane. Same guy. <laughs> and, uh, I know that you uh, play different uh, type of um, uh, bass guitar. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, do you prefer playing among the various options you've experienced, such as four string, five string, and six string bass guitar? Yeah. Uh, sometimes I have a lot of, you know, let's say people. Uh, they contact me and they have me play on their projects. I'll do a session sometimes. Uh, and most of the time they give me liberties. I, I'm at the point in my life that 
unless there's some creative freedom that people trust me with. Uh, I, I, I do not take the project uh, because that's, you know, I'm in quiet riot now. Back again, I've been back for about two and a half years and I have enough uh, instant gratification playing in the band that I really do not need to go outside of the band for that. What I, what I like to do is to have the opportunity to let my creativity lend it to a project. That's where the challenge is. I like to be challenged. It's like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. So I play my own producer. Sometimes they send me like a guide guide track and I, 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 I get in touch with them and I say, well, you know, I like, I, I can see where you want the bass to go. Uh, I, there's some other options that I'm thinking of playing wise, you know, melodically on the bass and, uh, and I will, um, I will send them to you. And if you're not happy with them, you know, we can we can uh, go go from there, but please allow me to give you what creatively I think this is this could be. Uh, because what happens is a lot of times I get guide tracks from guitar players, and they're very fundamental in their playing because they uh, they most guitar players. It's like me; I know what the role of the bass player is, but not as but much better than I know what the role of the guitar player is because I'm a bass player. So my, my perception in, in the band is within from where I see from my own eyes and hear things, right? So that's, that's my perception. I understand the role of the guitar player. I do understand how to support the guitar player, play with, play with a rhythm section, be part of the rhythm section, and also to support the vocals, which is a lot of times uh, when I get tracks, uh, guy tracks, they don't take that into consideration. They follow the guitar rather than to follow the vocals. And that's where the melody is. That's where the movement is. The guitar is a bed of, of, of chords. Yep. The, vo the vocals are moving with the melody. Mm -hmm. and, and if you listen to McCartney, you listen to James Jamerson, all of the, you know, uh, Carol Kay, I, I can give you a, a laundry list of bass players that do this. You have to listen to where, how, where is the vocals going? Because that's your support. The bass is supports the melody. You know, you, if you change a uh, great example, Brian Wilson, his compositions, he'll use low fifths to give, to give, to change the chord. The chord remains the same, but if you go to a lower fifth, it's going to give her a whole ethereal sound to it mm -hmm. that might make, make the melody even more poignant, you know, stick out even further because now you got this, this emotion behind the melody and the lyric that just moving the bass down a fourth, you know, which is really an octave of the fifth above, but just go down fourth, it's going to give it this, this movement that is going to make it sound majestic. If you listen to God Only Knows, it's filled with that. And it's just like, it's like it takes your breath away, you know. So I, I said, and Brian Wilson was the bass player in the band. So he understood, he understands the movement of how a bass can emotionally take the lyric and really validate what the singer, the message of the singer is. Wow. That's awesome. And Let's talk about wrestling. Yeah. Come yeah. on, it's, wrestling. It's it's completely <laughs> the, the same thing because uh, wrestling and music have a, a related part because you can uh, Every wrestler perform is... uh, with uh, a, a, a intact team. And uh, if you don't have a referee per Um, and if you don't have a timekeeper, if you don't have a two wrestler, the the match is can 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 be there, and that's the same thing for uh, a music group. If you don't have um, a, a bass player uh, with the drum or the pulsation, that's not uh, the 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 the. the, the you don't have the vibe you don't have the pulse the the movement and uh, with all the team 
that's a total package, my friend. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I grew up with the old, old school wrestling down in Miami Beach. There was a circuit down there, uh, Miami Beach Convention Center. I, I grew up in Miami. Okay. And, uh, you know, the days of Andre the Giant, the yep. great Malenko, Sputnik Monroe, you oh. know, the, the, the OG, you know, wrestling style. Yeah. And uh, I, I always found it to be an art form. Now it's even more of an art form because, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm really good friends with Chris Jericho. Oh, really? And, oh, and, yes, and he, uh, the, yeah. Uh, the, lead, the lead singer of Fozzy? Yes, he is the lead yeah, singer. Yeah, but, but you know, he's also a wrestler. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he's also a singer of Fozzy. As a matter of fact, uh, we were on the, on the Chris Jericho cruise last year. And uh, he came on uh, Quiet Riot, and he okay. came on and he sang with us. Okay. Then, I, then I played bass with with, with his band Fozzy. Um, I'm really good friends with PJ. Okay, uh, he was a bass player, you know, from Trickster, and so it's 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 part of the family. It's part it's part of the musical family, you know. And, and um, I, I I look at wrestling as an art form. There's a dance to it. There's a rhythm. There's a beat. There's a storyline, especially yeah. now, nowadays more than ever, because, you know, back in the day, we just, you know, like I, when I used to go to Miami Beach, uh, it, it was local. Now it's global. It's yeah. a global sense, you know, it's a global art form mm -hmm. and it's in, it's in most countries culture. And what happens is now it's, it's individuals, you know, just like you have bands that stand for something, they have a message. Mm -hmm. Now the wrestlers are characters. Yeah. You know, you and, mean, and they're that's and they're and, and they're and they're really real life superheroes. I mean, their physicality when they wrestle is like it's like watching a, a you know a Marvel movie. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like my God, it's you know. So yes, wrestling as an art form to me is completely the real deal. You know, I mean, you can't fake the stuff that they do. There's a storyline. There's a script to it. There's heroes and villains. And sometimes the villain turns into a hero. You know, it's like, it's very organic, never ends. It's just like, a, like, like listening to a great band or, or, you know, watching different matches or watching all these, uh, uh, in, you know, wrestlers uh, change, evolve through yeah. the years. You know, it's amazing. It's just like watching a band evolve through the years. Yes, exactly. And over the years, um, guys who play instrument involved with the, 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 the decades, and that's very interesting. So uh, the playing is very different. The technical is very different. And mm -hmm. uh, it is what it is. The evolution of the life. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And um, Earlier, you're talking about uh, Quiet Riot. So, uh, could you uh, share uh, more about your friendship with uh, the late Quiet Riot singer uh, Kevin uh, Dubro? Yeah, uh, Kevin and I we started playing together in 1978 uh, when I joined that version of the band, the Randy Rose version of the band, okay. and then I played in the band until like 1979 when Randy left uh, to join uh, Ozzy Osbourne. And then the, the name Quiet Riot ceased to exist. It was, there was no more Quiet Riot at the time. And then Kevin put his own band called Dubro. There's a book that gives you the whole chrono chronology of how things, the, the whole, you know, that era of Quiet Riot, Randy Rhodes era, Metal Health, Quiet Riot, and then in between, the, the missing link that most people don't know about is the band Dubro. Now, Kevin put that band together to actually, you know, develop his songwriting. He was, uh, it's not that, I don't think he really wanted to become a solo artist, but he just wanted to, him be at least the constant, the yeah. constant face in the band. Because we, around 79, late 79, 80, punk and new wave was the flavor of the day as far as the record companies were looking for new talent in Los Angeles. So, so musicians like ours, you know, like the Randy Rose version of the band, I mean, we were called dinosaurs, even though, you know, <laughs> I, I was a little bit older. I was in, you know, I was 24, 25, but the other guys, 
they were in their early, early 20s. You know, now I, had, I just turned 20. And to be called a dinosaur at 20 by somebody in a record company, that's, that, that's, that's pretty absurd, you know. Uh, but then again, there was no social media at the time. So record companies in, in L.A. had no idea what was going on in England, which which around that time, Iron Maiden was coming out, you know, getting together, Motorhead, all these bands uh, that became the, the staple of heavy metal in the 80s on MTV, including Ozzy. Ozzy was making a change. Yeah. He was putting this new band together in 79, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, so Kevin, you know, what he was facing in his own band was that people were not going to stick around. They, because everybody was trying to survive. We were all in survival mode. We were taking gigs here and there and just to pay the rent, you know, just to be able to stay in LA because a lot of us were not local. So we didn't have the support of the, lo- the, of the family unit that lived locally in Southern California. Uh, you know, like including myself, my family was in Miami. So it was, I, I, I had to hustle a lot in order to stay in Miami, stay in the fight. I mean, I'm sorry, stay in Los Angeles and stay in the fight, stay there in that, in that scene, you know, and, and, and hopefully find the right combination of musicians and songs and presentation that the record company would, would eventually um, sign us. But it didn't happen. So it is the way that it happened. Um, so uh, so I, I, I moved in with Kevin Dubro, and I lived with him for about eight months, and I'm playing in his band Dubro, and then I get the call to join Ozzy. Okay. And and uh, so I was gone from 80, 81 to about 82. This is when the uh, uh, sequence of events ha- started happening. Randy Rhodes passed away. You know, and yeah. Randy, yeah, Randy and I, any of us from Quiet Riot, you know, we were we were going, we were in sync with our journey of trying to make it in the music industry. Mm-hmm. You know, we were we were going through the same landscape. Yeah, going through this right mm-hmm. now. When I joined Ozzy, of course, Randy had already been there. You know, with Ozzy for about a year and a half, recorded the two records, uh, Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman, and compositions did some touring with Ozzy with Bob and Lee um, Bob Daisley and Lee Kerslake and so you know he's so he was even more advanced than I was because I was still sleeping on the floor in Kevin DeBro's apartment while he was doing all of this so so now I'm in the band but I can still relate to Randy as going on stage in the United States playing with Ozzy for the first time which was my first show with Ozzy in the Blizzard of Oz uh and that experience, it was all new to us, completely new. You know, going from town, well, okay, we've never been to Omaha. Wow, this is new. This is different. Let's go to the mall. Let's check it out. You know, stuff like that. Whereas Ozzy and Tommy Aldridge, they already been through it. You know, they had been successful already with uh, Tommy with uh, Black Oak, Arkansas, and Pat Travers. Mm-hmm. And then Ozzy, of course, with Black Sabbath. So to them, it wasn't, it wasn't the same thing. We were not on... On the freeway at the same, you know, traveling cars next to each other. We were like behind them, right? <laughs> and, uh, and so we were going through a different experience. And once Randy died, I lost that. Mm-hmm. I lost that, you know, I lost that. You know, at one point, it was two guys in Quiet Riot, that, that the band that had just been rejected, and this guy from Black Sabbath in the middle. And then the guy from, from uh, Black Oak, Arkansas, and Pat Travers in the back. That was the band. You know, so half the band was quiet from Quiet Riot. You know, so and, and so you know, I mean, it, it just lo- losing Randy and the band just changed everything for everybody, and, and including Sharon, of course, Sharon Osbourne. And uh, I gotta tell you, once okay, so I, I I'm in Los Angeles. This is September of of nineteen eighty two, and I get a phone call from uh, from Kevin saying, "Hey." We're finally in the studio. It looks like, you know, we're recording some demos for a possible record deal. And uh, how would you like to come down to record on Thunderbird? Now, that's a song that Kevin wrote for Randy when Randy left Quiet Riot to join Ozzy in 1979. And then Kevin wrote that song. And since I played in Dubrow, 
<laughs> for about eight months. I knew the song really well. And so I said, yeah, I'll come down and do it. Of course, you know, Randy had just passed away. That is the least I can do, you know, to, you know, to, to, to keep his memory, you know, as, as, right, play, the, play on this song as a tribute to his memory. So I went down there, and there is Frankie Benelli. Now, Frankie and I, we started playing 10 years prior to us finding ourselves in the studio to record Thunderbird. We met on my birthday, November 18, okay. 1972. And we started playing together immediately. We were in Florida, South Florida. And then disco happened and we just got, you know, we left Florida in pursuit of playing rock and roll. So we wound up in Chicago, um, toured the whole Midwest uh, market, club market. And then we wound up in LA. We saved enough money to be able to move to LA and uh, give it a shot for a year. So within a year, we, we couldn't get anything together. So we split up. Then I went back, I went to New Jersey um to play do some gigs got some money together came mm -hmm. back to la in 78 that's when i joined choir riot okay. you know so frankie and i and then so five years later or four years later we're actually finally in the studio recording so you know being in the studio with them carlos i just i had just met at that session i had never met it before but i knew about him from his band snow they used to play in the same circuit as dubro okay. and i believe choir riot back in the yeah and uh, so here I am, you know, I'm getting the joy of making music again, you know, with, with my old bandmates and, and, and friends. And uh, uh, so I, I recorded Thunderbird, uh, Slick Black Cadillac, which is the only song that made it from the Randy Rhodes era to the Metal Health record, and then a couple of uh, Dubrow, Dubrow era songs mm -hmm. uh, besides Thunderbird. Uh, uh, let's get crazy and loves a bitch. So that's four songs. You know, I thought we were making demos because that's what I was told. It was a small recording studio, nothing big like the Record Plan or Cherokee or or Larrabee Studios or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so then I I left a couple of days later to play on the uh, Speak of the Devil record. But the 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 thought of wow. What I it's, I found the joy of making music again, playing with Frankie and Kevin, uh, and and it was still very sad, very doom and gloom, being in you know after Randy passed away, you know just his 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 memory really linger over everybody, still does over me, but I've learned how to appreciate it rather than to be saddened by it. I I celebrate it. You know, yeah, and uh, so I'm after recording the uh, two nights live at the Ritz mm -hmm. in New York. That that record, I came back home and to LA and make the toughest decision I've ever made in my career wise, which is was to leave Ozzy, one of the biggest bands in the world. And they took great care of me, they were wonderful with me for the complete unknown. But I at least I knew that I was going to get some joy back in my playing again. And the rest is history. <laughs> cool. Okay, Mr. Sarzo, earlier in the interview, we, we were talking about uh, Ozzy and uh, the lovely Sharon, of course. Uh, is it true or not? Uh, but uh, there were a rumor circulating about an altercation between you and Ozzy Osborne backstage a couple of years ago where he punched you in the face. A couple of years ago? Yeah. Rumors of fact? A couple, like two years ago? No, couples of years ago, a few, a couple years, ago. Ago. A few, years, a few years, years ago, rumors of fact. Yeah, I, if you go to Wikipedia, it's on Wikipedia. I, I have a book and I wrote about it, it's in my book. Oh, okay, yeah. we did it. Uh, there's English and Japanese, so you can pick a language. And okay, <laughs> I like the Japanese version better. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> okay. okay, so uh. No, what happened was this is this happened in, in 1984. Okay. And yeah, 1984. Many, many years ago. Yeah. In Calum, oh yeah, 40 years ago. Um, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Okay, that, that's all. No, no problem. But, okay. And uh, when you were talking about uh, your book, it's all about the off uh, the rails book, right? Yes. 
Okay, okay. perfect. Let's so, go off the rails. Yes. Okay, perfect. So, um, everyone, if you want to um, read a really good book, so we invite you to go to uh, Amazon.com. It is uh, available uh, right now. So, uh, for uh, around uh, 20 bucks, uh, only 20 bucks, Half the Rails by Rudy Sarzo. Um, 20 bucks is, US? Yes. Is, is that Canadian? $20? Because yeah. in, in the US, it's $12.95. Uh, okay. Yes. It's, it's uh, 20 bucks in, in Canadian. Oh, Canadian. Okay. Oh, okay. Around uh, nine, 9 or $10 in, U, in US. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually $12.95 12, 12 in the okay. US. Okay, perfect. That, okay. Because I, I set the price, but, but okay. I never really... Uh, Transfer to Canadian, so I wasn't aware that it was twenty dollars. Yeah, it's also available in Kindle, and it's even I think it's like five forty. Uh, five forty. Yeah, five. Yeah, five dollars and forty cents. A, a Kindle download. Yeah, which is uh, a muffin. <laughs> <laughs> a muffin <laughs> at, at Starbucks. Yeah, or Tim Horton for you guys. Muffin, exactly. And maybe uh, two two donuts at the yeah, exactly. yeah. maybe maybe. <laughs> yeah. how, did you, uh, how did you react when you learned uh, that you will be inducted into the Metal Hall of Fame in 2017? Yeah, we were uh, one of the first inductees. I mean, you know, the way I look at things like that, you know, when you get some accolades or you know, you get some award, it I look at the people that I'm being awarded along with. Mm -hmm. And that to me is the, uh, it's the most significant thing because look, mm -hmm. I've been a fan of music longer than I've been a professional musician. Yeah. And I will remain a fan until the day that I'm not here anymore. Notice I did not use the word die because <laughs> we don't die. Our consciousness keeps traveling. But then that's another, another podcast. Okay. <laughs> so my body physically will no longer be here. And uh, I was still, you know, my consciousness will still be a fan. You know, uh, it's really interesting because, you know, pe people, you know, they own social media. They post like, wow, well, it's amazing that we are born in the era of usually it's Van Halen. Mm -hmm. And I go, yeah, but we miss Bach or we miss Chopin. And Mozart. So it's like, I, th I think every era has some good. Glad you're here because there's this music available to us. And we actually got to watch the band. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. See, we can, there's no Bach podcast. No Bach. Talking to anybody. You know, this one, this one, someday people are going to be, you know, 2000 years from now. Listening to us talking and going, what the hell are they talking about? <laughs> <laughs> and for our uh, pre-closing segment, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, your practically 40 minutes of your generous time. This is very appreciated. Uh, I give you a, a name and a few words. Tell me something uh, about them, all right? Okay. So, uh, the first one is uh, Jimi Hendrix. Jimi Hendrix. Game changer. Yeah, that makes sense because... Uh, Still does. <laughs> a piece of history, of music history. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, David uh, Coverdale. Here Blues. I come again. <laughs> Blues singer. Yeah. Paul McCartney? Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't find a better word than wow. One of the best. Yes, one of the best. Well, it's going... beyond. It's, it's beyond best. It's like, see, I would have said best. No, it's wow. I mean, how can you describe Paul McCartney in one word? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Rob Zombie. Rob Zombie. Uh, probably the most interesting man in the world. The fact that he can gravitate from music to film and, and represent a, a uh, define a genre mm -hmm. tied in from his music to his film. So he said he's really a true artist. I would say artist. And he is a very good creative artist. So we can do practically, he is very versatile yeah. and yeah. he can yeah. 
need a lot of things. So. Yeah, but that's more than one word. So, <laughs> yeah, of course. And the last one, Ruby Sarzo, yourself. <laughs> I'm trying to find the one word. Hey, uh, okay, I'll make a one word, which is three words work in progress. Yeah, yeah. That okay. makes sense because every day we learn a lot of things. So that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Uh, Nostradamus Ben, it's all about the French prophet, and that's why he, uh, he have uh, this the nickname. Uh, the nickname. So <clears throat> he tried to predict the future of our guests. Okay. Uh, first of all, Mr. Mr. Yeah. <laughs> first of all, uh, first of all, for uh, first of all, thank you so much for the interview. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it was a uh, great, uh, huge. Uh, okay, Mr. Sarzo, I predict to you uh, probably another uh, cruise with uh, Chris Jericho, maybe next summer. Yes. That would be great. I love Chris. His okay. family is wonderful. Met oh, his yeah. dad. Uh, great. Uh, and you know what's really interesting about the uh, the wrestling cruise versus the Monsters of Rock cruise, which we also did this year. A Monsters of Rock is primarily people are there to you know experience the rock bands not performing, including myself. I saw a lot of shows. <laughs> That right. I Glenn Hughes was my favorite. Then after that, KK Priest. I I know Tim Ripper. Uh, we've done projects together. We've been on the road together. And of course, I know KK. Uh, when Quiet Riot open opened up for Judas Priest, and they were the kindest band that we experienced uh, opening up for. So you know, I I, I love what they're doing. And uh, I mean, there were a lot of great bands. You know, Darkness played and and uh, Ace Frehley. But there's something about the wrestling cruise that it was more like a uh, like one of those conventions, you know, comic cons, mm -hmm. there that people are there to experience face to face with superheroes, yeah. their favorite wrestler. Who, in my eyes, I mean, these are superheroes in the flesh. This is no CGI trick trickery. Oh, wow. Going on, they what they what you see when they fly through the air, they're flying through the air. Yeah, you know. Thank you for the interview, yeah. uh, Rudy. That was a pleasure for this uh, forty-three uh, generous minutes of uh, of your time of your life. <laughs> yes, I wish you all the best, and uh, we Thank predict, you. of course, uh, the LT. This is very, uh, very important. No strategy. Yes. <laughs> Take care. Have a great one, and I talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you so much, Bernoulli and Jonathan. Thank you so much. God bless you. Goodbye.